Hi class, so today we're going to discuss gene regulation in prokaryotes. So first, let's discuss this term gene expression. What does gene expression mean? Well, when a gene is being expressed, it means that it is being transcribed and translated into its product. So why do cells need to be able to regulate their gene expression? Why do they need to determine whether a gene is on or off? Well, today we'll focus on uh, that for prokaryotes. It gets a little more complex in eukaryotes. But in single-celled organisms, they regulate their gene expression in order to be able to respond to their environment. So today we will focus on two specific examples of uh, responses to the environment in bacteria called E. coli. And these E. coli live in your gut, uh, in your large intestine, and they basically live off of your leftovers. So whatever food you don't digest and absorb yourself, that undigested, those, that undigested food goes into your large intestine and it's a source of nutrition for those bacteria. So they need to be able to digest food when it becomes available. So for example, if you drink a glass of milk, that milk has lactose in it, any leftover lactose goes into your large intestine and the bacteria need to be able to produce an enzyme to break down that lactose into glucose and galactose, which they can then use for energy. So they only should produce this enzyme when lactose is available to them. If it's not there, then why waste energy making that enzyme? Now, please don't get this confused with lactose tolerance or intolerance in humans. That's a specific, that's a completely different concept. So um, if you're, say, lactose tolerant and you have milk, you will produce your own enzyme that you use to digest the lactose. But then some of that lactose is still not fully digested. It goes into your large intestine and then the E. coli make their own enzyme to digest your leftovers. Now, another example of an environmental response is that the E. coli need to be able to synthesize specific nutrients when they need them. So, for example, there's this molecule called tryptophan that they need and they can produce it themselves through this multi-step pathway involving several different enzymes. Now, if tryptophan is available to them, such as from your food leftovers, then they don't need to waste energy making these enzymes. But if it's not available to them, then they do need to turn on the genes to make these enzymes and thus make tryptophan for themselves. Now we will talk about how prokaryotes are able to regulate the genes that produce those enzymes that I mentioned. So prokaryotes organize their genes into something called operons. And here's a diagram of a, a generic operon. So an operon consists of several genes, the number can vary, but all of the genes within one oper operon um, code for molecules that are involved in the same metabolic pathway. In front of these genes is the promoter sequence. The promoter is where RNA polymerase binds and it is then able to transcribe these genes. So it transcribes these genes into messenger RNA as one unit. The promoter also consists of a DNA sequence referred to as the operator. And the operator you could think of as an on-off switch, and that will make more sense later. Now, somewhere else in the DNA, not part of the operon itself, is another gene that's referred to as the regulatory gene. This regulatory gene has its own promoter sequence to which RNA polymerase binds, transcribes the gene, then it's translated into a transcription factor. You could think of a transcription factor like a regulatory protein. It will regulate the transcription of other genes, and it can either activate transcription or repress transcription. The best way to understand how operons work is to learn about specific examples of operon regulation. So we will first talk about the trip operon. 
The trip operon consists of a group of five genes all clustered together, all together on the same piece of DNA. And these genes are responsible for producing the enzymes that will then make tryptophan. The operon also consists of the promoter sequence, and part of that is the operator, that on-off switch. Elsewhere in the DNA is the trip regulatory gene. The trip regulatory gene makes a repressor protein that has the ability to bind to the operator and then turn off its transcription. When tryptophan is not available to the bacteria and they need to be able to produce it themselves, they need this operon to be on. What's interesting is that this repressor protein is by default made in an inactive shape. So when it's inactive, it's not able to bind to the operator and it is not able to shut it off. In this case, RNA polymerase is able to bind and then move along the DNA transcribing these genes. So in the absence of tryptophan, the operon is on. So as these genes are being transcribed and translated, the enzymes will gradually start to produce tryptophan. So more and more tryptophan accumulates inside the cells. Eventually they'll have plenty and they wanna be able to shut off this operon. So what's really interesting is that as tryptophan accumulates, the tryptophan itself will bind to the repressor protein, change its shape, and make it active. This active repressor then binds to the operator and shuts off the operon. It does it by acting basically like a roadblock. So RNA polymerase comes in, but it's not able to move along the DNA transcribing the genes. So in the presence of tryptophan, tryptophan binds to the repressor, activates it, the repressor binds to the operator, and turns the operon off. Now eventually, these bacteria will run out of tryptophan. It's an important nutrient for them. So as they use up their tryptophan, and this tryptophan then is broken down. There's no tryptophan to bind to the repressor. The repressor will turn back into its inactive shape and come off the operator. At that point, RNA polymerase will be able to transcribe these genes again. So if you think about it, it's a beautiful system. The tryptophan is able to shut off transcription of its own enzymes. And now we will discuss the regulation of the LAC operon. The LAC operon is involved in producing the enzymes that are needed for the bacteria to digest lactose. Now they only need these enzymes if lactose is available to them in their environment, such as after you've had some milk or maybe some ice cream. So this LAC operon consists of a cluster of three genes that are transcribed together and then translated to make enzymes that are involved in the uptake and digestion of lactose. The operon also has a promoter and an operator, the on-off switch. Elsewhere in the DNA is the LAC regulatory gene, which has its own promoter. This regulatory gene is transcribed and translated into a repressor protein. Now, you are not having dairy all the time, so much of the time lactose is not available to the bacteria. So it makes sense that by default, this operon would be off. So in the absence of lactose, this repressor is in an active shape. So when it's first translated, it is actually active and it can immediately go and bind to the operator sequence and act like a roadblock for RNA polymerase. So in the absence of lactose, the repressor is active and binding, and RNA polymerase cannot transcribe these genes, and the operon is off. If you then have some dairy, and the bacteria now have lactose available to them in your large intestine, so in the presence of lactose, 
Allolactose, which is a form of lactose, binds to the repressor and inactivates it. So this green triangle represents the allolactose binding to the repressor protein, changes its shape. The inactive repressor is no longer able to bind to the operator sequence. And thus, RNA polymerase can now come in and move along this DNA transcribing these genes. So in the presence of lactose, the repressor is not binding and the operon is on. As the bacteria digest all the lactose and they no longer have any lactose available to them, then lactose will not be binding to the repressor. The repressor will go back to its active shape and will bind to the operator again and shut it off again. So just like the trip operon, the lac operon regulation is very logical. Lactose is able to turn on the transcription of the genes needed to digest it. And when lactose is not there, then the operon is off. So the two operons we've discussed are examples of repressible operons versus inducible operons. So the trip operon is a good example of a repressible operon. These usually function in chemical pathways that build molecules. By default, their transcription will be on, which makes sense. If it's a molecule that the bacteria need, it makes sense for this operon to be on until enough enzymes are made to build the necessary nutrients. But then binding of a co-repressor, such as tryptophan, to a repressor protein activates the repressor and shuts off transcription. So these operons are usually on, but then they can be repressed, so they're repressible. On the other hand, the LAC operon is a great example of an inducible operon. These usually function in chemical pathways that break down molecules. By default, their transcription will be off, which makes sense. If that molecule that needs to be broken down isn't available, why spend energy transcribing the genes from the operon? So the transcription is normally off, but then binding of an inducer, such as allolactose, inactivates the repressor and turns on transcription. So as if that wasn't complicated enough, we have a little more detail to add. In some cases, it is not enough for repressor protein to be inactive and binding. You also need an activator protein to turn on the transcription. So one example is CRP, or cyclic AMP receptor protein. And that's shown here, and it's shown binding to DNA, which is in red. So CRP can bind to specific sequences in DNA and help activate transcription, help RNA polymerase actually do its job. So E. coli use CRP to activate several different operons, and the LAC operon is one of those. Why does the LAC operon need both a repressor and an activator protein? Well, these bacteria that live in your gut have a variety of food available to them, depending on what you eat. So let's say there's both lactose and glucose available to them. Well, it turns out that they much prefer the glucose. Do you have a favorite food? For me, if you give me a choice of white chocolate and dark chocolate, I'll only bother spending the energy to reach for the dark chocolate. With the white chocolate, I won't bother trying to waste energy reaching for it and unwrapping it. Unless I don't have another choice, then maybe. So for bacteria, it's not so much a preference as that glucose is easier and quicker for them to digest. So when both of these molecules are available, they rather do not waste energy producing the enzymes to make, to make the enzymes to digest lactose. So in the presence of both lactose and glucose, 
the repressor is inactive because allolactose is binding to it and inactivating it. So there's no roadblock for RNA polymerase, but that doesn't matter. Turns out that RNA polymerase still can't transcribe these genes because in the presence of glucose, CRP is in its inactive shape and not binding to the DNA and thus not helping to activate RNA polymerase. Now, when lactose is present and glucose is absent, now the repressor is inactive because allolactose is inactivating it. And the absence of glucose helps to activate CRP. So CRP is now in its active shape, binding to the DNA and activating RNA polymerase so that RNA polymerase can now transcribe these genes and they'll be translated into the enzymes to digest lactose. But remember that only happens when the bacteria both have lactose and they don't have glucose. So we're at the conclusion of the lesson, but I'd like to leave you with a question. So I'll ask you some specific questions about this graph. Please write down the answer and bring it to class for us to discuss. So in this graph, um, it shows the results of an experiment where they looked at the effects of adding glucose and then lactose to a culture of bacteria. So the x-axis shows time and the y-axis shows bacterial mass. So the higher the mass, the more bacteria were growing in this culture flask. So they, at time zero, they added some glucose. And then at this particular time, they added lactose. I'm going to separate the graph into four segments. So this will be segment A. Here is segment B. Here is segment C. And then the last is segment D. So in each of these segments, I'd like you to write down what do you observe is happening and then write down an explanation. Why do you think that's actually happening with the bacteria? So what's the biological basis behind what you observe with the bacterial growth? All right, so that was the end of the lesson. I hope it was useful.